So welcome to this webinar organized by the Swiss DR NGO platform. Um, climate finance is becoming an increasingly relevant um, topic for Swiss NGOs working on climate change and DRR as an additional financing source. Um, we therefore have uh, hold a climate finance webinar series to support the NGOs better and understand better the current climate finance landscape and also the access criteria of uh, different climate funds. Um, last year's webinar in August 22 mainly focused on the Green Climate Fund. Um, by the way, the recording is available on the website of the Swiss DRR NGO platform. And in this event, we'll put an emphasis on the German International Climate Initiative, um, in brief, ICI, uh, which was launched in 2008 by the German government um, in the field of climate protection and biodiversity conservation. Um, I will start with some technical tips. Um, your microphones, they are muted by default. You can uh, post your questions directly into the chat and we will then address them during the Q&A. Uh, in case you couldn't hear or see anything, you should close and restart the webinar and, and also close other programs. And yeah, just for your information, this webinar is being recorded and will then be shared via the DRR and your platform's website. Please also have your mobile phone at hand um, because in the course of the webinar, we will work with a um, mentee. So um, just a quick overview on the program. Um, after a quick welcome and introduction by myself, we will have um, Thomas Hirsch, um, consultant of the Climate and Development Advice, um, giving us uh, an overview of the climate finance architecture in general, and then uh, presenting a portrait of the ICI and um, presenting different funding mechanisms, requirements, etc. Um, his presentation will be divided into two parts. Um, after the first part, we will take some questions for clarifications and then also um, more questions after uh, the second part. And then I will just quickly close um, yeah, at the end of the program. The official program is until um, 14, 15, um, but if the Q&A needs more time, we can extend it to um, half past two. So first of all, um, there is a question with Menti. We would like you to participate. Um, you can either go to the website menti.com and use the code um, that you see here, or just um, yeah, enter via the QR code. So I will give you some time to just open it. I will also do myself. So did your organization already apply for Iki funds? The answers are still um, entering. I will wait a bit more if more people will um, answer the question. Okay, now we have 15 people participating, that's fine. So um, 
we have um, already some organizations that have applied already for ICI funds, some don't, don't know, uh, and also 40% um, which didn't apply yet. So that's interesting to know. Um, I think we also will be able in the Q&A sessions maybe to have a bit uh, more closer look also on the those organizations that have applied maybe successfully or unsuccessfully. Thank you. So let's uh, continue with the introduction. Um, I'd like to introduce Thomas Hirsch. Um, he um, has kindly agreed to make this presentation on ICI. He has um, 20 years of professional experiences in international politics and climate finance, also development cooperation and environmental science. He has um, also worked for Greenpeace as a policy advisor, um, also um, for FIAN um, International as a finance director and um, for Bread for the World as lead on climate policy and later as development policy representative. Um, he founded the climate um, and development advice. It's a consulting consultancy specialized in political consulting, climate development and human rights and is based in Germany. And what he could also say is that he's a real icky expert. Um, so he has uh, served as proposal management manager for uh, several concept notes submitted to ICI in recent years, has provided also input on ICI policies to the Federal German Ministry for Environment since the very beginning of ICI. And most recently, he also served um, as an external independent uh, evaluator for ICI to assess concept notes. So um, he's the right person to talk to when you want to know more about Iki. So um, thank you very much, um, Thomas, um, for joining us. And I would like to um, yeah, give you the word. Thank you very much, Maya. Warm welcome to everybody from my side as well. I'm very much looking forward to that session. Um, I have prepared a PowerPoint. I will not go through all the details of all the slides, but you will get um, the PowerPoint afterwards as a PDF file, so you can deepen your knowledge and you, you can click on certain links to get further information. Um, now I will start the screen sharing. Maya, you need to give me back the rights, please. It's already working, I think. Okay. We can now see. it's working. <clears throat> Perfect. Thank you very much. So I, I have divided my presentation in four parts, and we will make the first break for a first round of questions and answers after part two. I will start with providing a very short overview on climate finance altogether. I will then give a portrait of the German ICI International Climate Initiative. Then we will make the stop. You can raise your questions. We can also factor in um, recommendations or maybe experience of both of you who already applied for ICI. And then in the second part, I will deepen a little bit more the discussion on what are the ICI selection criteria, the formal ones, and also what are key evaluation criteria. I will not um, share any confidential information, but I will share everything that I can share, and that's um, a little bit more than what is on the ICI website. And I will then close my presentation with providing some recommendations for those of you who consider to apply for ICI um, when the next call is going to open early next year. So let us start with a short overview on climate finance. Um, yesterday, um, the new OECD figures were presented on the current status of climate finance. And we all know in less than one week from today, 
the next uh, climate uh, conference is going to start in, um, in Glasgow. And one of the big issues is in how far um, the OECD countries manage to fulfill their pledge to provide 100 billion climate finance annually from 2020 onwards. And uh, we all knew before that um, new figures were presented yesterday that there is a gap and that this gap is still significant. So this is being shown in the first slide. From here, you can take that in 2019, the last year for which um, figures are available, um, the total amount of climate finance provided to the developing world was of about only 80, 80 billion and not 20 billion. And what we can take from here as well is that um, less than 30% is bilateral public climate finance. And that is, for example, um, the provision of ICI, that there is 34 billion of multilateral climate finance. And that would be, for example, the Green Climate Fund. That, um, and that there is about 14 billion coming from the private sector. And that would also include private foundations or organizations like yours, and so far as they handle um, non-public funds, private donations. And the main reason why the, the 100 billion uh, were not reached is that um, compared to the forecast that was met in 2016, the share of um, the private sector falls considerably short. So what um, are developed countries um, going to do? What they proposed yesterday, and that was a common proposal of um, the governments of Canada and Germany. They were entitled by the COP presidency to make um, a proposal how to go ahead. What they said is, uh, we collected figures. Uh, we are now able to make a forecast on the years up uh, to 2025. And according to these forecasts, um, we foresee that until 2022, there will be still a gap, but that from 2023 onwards, in two different scenarios, the, the gap will be closed and um, overshooted so that by 2025, and that is the key message coming from them, in average, um, the 100 billion pledge would have been fulfilled for all the years between 2020 and 2025. And uh, you can find more on that when you click on the link to the source provided here. Um, I will skip that slide. You will find that as well. That um, gives a little bit more details from which sources, according to the forecast, the money will come in the years um, up and until 2025. This slide is complicated and maybe not so easy to read or to see on your screen, but uh, you can click on it when you get the PowerPoint and open it and um, make it bigger, zoom in. And what you find here is the global architecture of climate finance. And uh, we see different layers. So um, on the upper end, we see the different contributing countries. And the biggest, biggest donors of climate finance are um, the US, the UK, France, Japan, and Germany. And um, they deliver climate finance through different um, channels, through different ministries, through different funds. And they are, or the most important ones are shown here in the next layer, bilateral institutions. And uh, then we have the same for the multilateral institutions providing climate finance. Here we distinguish between those which are related to the UNFCCC, the United Climate, uh, the, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And the biggest fund here would be the Green Climate Fund. 
But then we have also non-UNFCCC related financial institutions like the UN agencies and very important, the multilateral development banks, World Bank and all the regional banks. And then we have another of other um, types of um, regional pools or funds um, that also contribute to climate finance. Finally, we have the recipient countries and they themselves at least in part, also operate their own climate funds, which are um, sourced by national finance. But um, they also have um, funds created to absorb um, international climate finance provided by the international donor community. And then, of course, you have all um, the different ways how NGOs uh, channel their funds um, through the different partners in the recipient countries. A guide to climate finance um, was elaborated um, in 2018 for the Action of Churches Together Act Alliance. It's um, a resource guide. It covers altogether about 60 funds. And um, this is something I recommend for you to look at because um, in this resource guide, um, a strong focus was put on the question, which funds are eligible for non-state actors for NGOs? Um, because many, if not most of um, donors of international climate finance um, source governments or um, intergovernmental organizations, but not NGOs. And from that guide, you can take guidance whom to address if you work in a certain area and if you are interested um, to also look for other third party funding. And important to note that this 2018 climate finance guide has now been updated by the Christian Commission for Development, in short, CCDB in Bangladesh. That is a Bangladeshi NGO. They will um, launch a climate um, knowledge hub very soon. And part of that knowledge hub is a climate finance navigator using uh, the different criteria of that resource guide, but with updated information for 20. 21. Last um, year, you looked at the Green Climate Fund. Um, this is by far the most prominent um, fund, but um, one which is um, less accessible for NGOs. It's difficult for NGOs to become accredited implementing entities, which would enable you to directly access the funds. Um, it's also um, difficult to um, prepare concept notes because of high technical and organizational barriers of the GCF. Um, if you look, if you consider it all to apply, then probably uh, the most promising way is to access the uh, GCF as an executing entity. That means in cooperation with another organization which is accredited by the GCF. There is a number of websites um, and climate funding or climate finance navigators. And the most relevant of them you find on that slide. Later on, you can click here and then um, you will be able to hopefully navigate successfully through the jungle of climate finance um, institutions throughout the world. Um, the one which might be uh, the most elaborated is the one of the NDC partnership, because it has um, a tool that helps you to um, set a lot of criteria. And then you might find your way a little bit easier to the right donor as compared to other um, climate finance navigators. Now let's talk a little bit about ICI, the International Climate Initiative. It was established already in 2008 by the German Federal Ministry for the Environment. Um, it's the flagship fund of that 
ministry. It um, considers itself as an integral and innovative part of international climate finance and important international um, biodiversity protection funding. It's um, explicitly aligned with the UNFCCC, the Paris Agreement, the Convention on Biodiversity, and a number of other relevant um, international policy frameworks, like, for example, um, for the sector of urbanization, the new urban agenda. And it's also very much aligned with um, the SDGs. It supports particularly the implementation of the NDC partnership, which I mentioned before, and which is an international alliance um, aiming at supporting developing countries to ambitiously uh, set up and fulfill their national pledges under the Paris Agreement, the so-called NDCs. Um, it also supports the implementation of the bond challenge on reforestation. Therefore, you always find in the thematic icky calls um, reforestation um, topics as one or sometimes even more than one priority areas of a given year. And they also support the New York Declaration on Forests. By the end of 2020, approximately 800 projects were funded with altogether 4.5 billion euro. And um, the figures for this year are not yet published, but um, it will add another um, round about 220 to 250 million euro. The ICI is a unit of the Ministry for the Environment. There they have the so-called ICI Secretariat. And um, the ICI Secretariat can either be approached directly, if you have any questions, if you go through the ICI website, or um, you can approach uh, the so-called ZOOC, that stands for Future Environment and Society in German. And uh, the ZOOC is a non profit company, which was established by the ICI Secretariat, which is, in the end of the day, a unit of the ministry to administer um, all the applications and the management of the fund. So therefore, um, you can also, if you have technical questions directly, contact ZOOC. The ICI has a number of funding windows. The most important one is the so-called annual thematic call. There was no call, uh, or there is no call going to be launched um, in December this year. Usually ICI launches its thematic call in December, but it will only be opened in 2022, in the second quarter of 2022. And the reason given for that is that ICI wants to assess the outcome of um, the COP26 and also um, this round of negotiations under the Biodiversity Convention to then shape the, the profile of um, the next thematic call in a way that it serves um, in the best possible way, the, um, the follow up to these um, important international negotiations. <clears throat> Under the thematic call, the, um, the volume per project is between five and 30 million euro. It's usually four to six year projects. Sometimes it can also be a little bit less. The annual grant volume for the thematic call is 160 million, was so far, and you can expect that it will be significantly higher next year. Um, apart from the thematic call, there are three other funding windows, the annual country calls. So every year there are country calls for a number of countries, usually maybe three to five countries. And under each of these country calls, two to four projects um, 
will be approved with a grant volume between 12 and 15 million per project. These country calls are launched in a very close cooperation with the ministry and the partner country. So they are much more related to um, the agreements on environmental cooperation or climate cooperation, say, between Vietnam and Germany, if we talk about the Vietnam country call. And therefore, under this um, call, the money usually, not always, but usually goes to applicants that are relatively uh, closely involved in the um, implementation of these bilateral programs. And that is, in many cases, the German GIZ. Therefore, I would consider the country call less relevant for organizations like yours. The medium grants call is directed to German NGOs, but they can partner with organizations uh, which are working in developing countries. They can be either from the developing country itself or they have an office there and their own legal um, entity or registration. So if one of your organizations, for example, has a regional or, or national office in Nepal, is um, registered in Nepal, then you can um, twin together with the German NGO to apply under the medium grants call. The, the amount here is much smaller, 300 to 800,000 euro per project. Um, and the projects are usually of a duration of two, two to three years and each year one medium grant call with specific um, priority topics is being launched. And then there is the annual small grants call and that um, is a, a funding window that is accessible only for small and medium-sized not-for-profit organizations in the Global South. That could not be your country office, but maybe you have partners in countries in the Global South who would be interested to apply by themselves. And um, here you can get grants between 70 and 200,000 euro. Um, and in this call, there is always also a specific um, budget um, for capacity development um, activities. So that could be interesting as well. And more information you'll find on the link provided um, at the bottom line of that slide. Now, um, let's talk a little bit more about the eligibility criteria and the landscape of partners under the big the thematic call. Eligible for funding as implementing organizations, and that is lead applicants or consortium members, are non-governmental organizations only. Governments are not eligible, but NGOs are university research institutions also multilateral organizations and the commercial or the business sector as well. Um, the landscape of partners until the end of 2020, about 180 um, partners got contracts as um, lead applicants or consortium members. And out of these 180, um, a good part of them um, were international or multilateral organizations like UNEP, like UNDP, um, also multilateral development banks, FAO and others. So these multilateral or international organizations are definitely overrepresented. Um, then also overrepresented um, GIZ, WWF, um, IUCN, and other big um, organizations from the environmental and climate sector. Relatively underrepresented organizations from the non environmental sectors, for example, um, development organizations, humanitarian organizations, trade unions, indigenous organizations, also the business sector. 
and um, also, and I would say, say significantly underrepresented organizations which have their headquarters in countries of the global south. From Switzerland, I started to click through the list of implementing partners this morning. Then after half of them, I stopped. From Switzerland, I found IUCN and WWF, and you may argue rightly, these are organizations based in Switzerland, but they are not really Swiss. I maybe other um, originally Swiss organizations in the past already also got funding and maybe some of you who applied, successfully applied, uh, would be interesting to know that. The thematic priorities are clearly defined. This is number one, mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions. And mitigation projects are preferably approved for countries um, with a high potential for greenhouse gas reduction. And that is <clears throat> middle income countries or emerging economies, or also newly industrialized countries in the Eastern part of Europe. The second priority area is climate adaptation. And here there is a certain preference to approve projects from countries which are considered as highly climate vulnerable. And that is Africa, small island developing states, and um, also least developed countries altogether. <clears throat> there is a third um, priority area, and that is um, the conservation of carbon sinks, forests and soils with a focus on red plus projects. And here there is a certain preference to approve projects being implemented in countries that are particularly inclined to work on carbon storage and biodiversity. And that is forest nations or countries like Costa Rica, for example, Ecuador. The fourth area is the conservation of bio biological diversi diversity, biodiversity, I should say. And here projects are mostly approved and implemented in countries and regions with a rich biodiversity or with a visible and strong commitment under the respective UN convention. Um, Examples are, for example, um, countries from the Andes in Latin America, um, but also countries like, again, Costa Rica or Ethiopia. Under these four main thematic priority areas, in each annual call, more specific thematic priorities are being defined. And they are described in the annual calls, and that should direct you when you consider to apply. And the project portfolio you can find on the ICI website. You can search according to countries, topics, donors, and so on and so forth. And uh, that I think gives a good overview what type of projects have been funded in the past. The application procedure is relatively simple. There is a launch of the call once per year, and that is published in the ICI, on the ICI website or in the ICI newsletter, which you can subscribe. Next thematic call, as I said, will be launched in um, the second quarter of 2022. The calls are usually open for two to three months. The application forms are available on the website for download. You only have to register once for that. And then you get the um, online application form. And then um, on top of that, uh, you will be provided by application guidelines. And which is um, quite important for newcomers, you can then subscribe to webinars provided by the ICI Secretariat, where um, main features of the call and the application procedure are being presented and where you can raise questions and answers. And also you can 
um, um, send your questions by email and you will get an answer during um, the time when the call is open. In the end, you just upload um, your application together with the annexes to the Iki application platform. The length of the application is strictly limited and so is the length of every section. But what is allowed and what is strongly recommended by you to be used is to provide additional annexes. Um, because of the fact that the length of um, the application is very short and that will not allow you to really enroll all the details you may want to share, nor is it um, a good means to show visualization, how you work together with different partners and what are the um, the work streams of your project, everything you want to visualize, you do in form of annexes, which you then can upload. Um, so this year, annexes plus um, the original form altogether about 20 pages in the thematic call and only five to 10 pages in the medium grants call. That shows you that you have to be short and precise. Here I make a first stop so that we can uh, go through the first um, list of questions. Thank you very much, Thomas, um, for this hands-on information and including all the useful links and also the up-to-date information um, with regard to climate finance uh, facts and figures. Um, we have one question in the chat um, from Matthias Herr. Um, I'll just read it to you. Does the private sector contribution to climate finance include investment into circular economy and new business models? Means funds invested in the expectation of generating a role? I think it stops there. But um, yeah, I think the question is especially on the uh, figure that you presented where the, you can see the share of um, private funds and yeah, the question a bit, what is attributable really to climate finance and what is not? And if yeah, circular economy, for example, is or not? Well, the answer for um, everything that is attributable to the private finance part of international climate finance is it's not defined. It's not defined well and sharp. So in the end of the day, there are so many loopholes that um, almost everything is possible, I would say. And that is a big criticism of all the NGOs, but also, of course, of the developing countries. And therefore, um, in theory, um, investments into circular economy are most probably um, attributable or would be accounted under the private sector window. What is attributable is a little bit more strict um, in the other sectors, the multilateral and the um, bilateral climate finance sector. And then there is um, Another question, and that is a very good one. It points to the right um, entry point for you. It asks, with NGOs being underrepresented, would you think that there is appetite of ICI for more proposals from humanitarian NGOs? And my answer would be yes. There is appetite to get more proposals for adaptation, for climate disaster risk reduction, more proposals um, coming from consortiums where partner organizations from the global south play a significant role, and more proposals coming from the non-environmental sector of NGOs, and that could be political foundations, humanitarian organizations, development organizations, and others. I'm making that point because of the fact that ICI has been criticized 
lightly criticized, I would say, for having a certain bias in its um, project portfolio. And uh, the IK leadership is well aware of that criticism and at least partly um, shares it. And therefore, um, it's likely that IK in future will try to make attempts to find a better balance. And that I would say works towards the benefit of organizations like yours. Thank shall you very I read much. the next? Shall I read the um, next? Yeah, I'll. Or you read it. Sorry. There are <laughs> there are new questions coming in. Um, the next one is from uh, Caritas. Um, if mitigation calls are mostly focused on medium economies that can bring carbon reduction sequestration to scale, do you think it's worth applying for mitigation if you are in a small country with little potential for reaching scale? I would say if you have, if you um, are able to significantly reduce greenhouse gases through your project. So if the numbers in terms of tons of uh, mitigated emissions are significant, then um, I think your project will be interesting for Ike. And um, the other question is small country. If the country is very small, then usually Iki is hesitant to um, favorably consider such an application. Hesitant is saying hesitant, does not say it's a no-go. It's not a kick out criteria, but then they are usually hesitant and then they would usually prefer to see um, a regional cooperation. And then you may, maybe you work on a small island developing state in the Caribbean and you have the chance to cooperate in your project with two or three neighboring small island developing states. And then you form a consortium with, with more than one country. And then you can overcome that hurdle that your country is relatively small. Same, for example, is true for Central America, where Iki usually apart from um, exceptions and Costa Rica is not very eager to fund a project say only in Guatemala or Honduras or El Salvador. But if it is a regional one, then you can overcome that barrier. But altogether, I would say it's, um, you are slightly disadvantaged if um, the greenhouse gas uh, mitigation potential and its mainstreaming and upscaling potential is relatively small. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this answer. Um, we have another question of Johan Tenhoff of Medair. Um, would a public-private partnership with, for example, a solar company be eligible for support to offset carbon emissions in the vulnerable countries mentioned? For example, solar solarification of clinics, water systems? Cooperation with the private sector is possible and um, the ministry is quite open to that. In fact, they have even a strategic interest to bring on board or to attract more, um, more investments of the private sector and that you can see from some of their calls. So in this regard, a clear yes. Um, working on solarization or um, boosting renewables in a, in a developing country is also definitely interesting. Offsetting um, is a partic particular way to do these investments. And um, offsetting is not a general no-go for ICI, they or the ministry itself is offsetting its travel emissions. Um, but if you work with offsetting approaches, then you have definitely to ensure that your partner 
or the offsetting scheme you use is uh, one with a high reputation, is fulfilling the CDM gold standard and um, is not a one under the clean development mechanism which is questionable because uh, these questionable offsetting schemes are clearly not favored by the ministry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I think we will take the last two questions um, and then continue with the second part. There is one question um, of uh, Nicole. Um, is co-financing co required or an advantage? And maybe also the second maybe bit related question um, from Hex. Brazil, can an NGO partner with a private company and can the private company receive funds via thematic call notice to develop deforestation, carbon sequestration actions? Um, on the second one, you can channel funds to a private company via the thematic call. But maybe then the best way is to make that private company not an implementing partner, but um, a cooperating partner. Um, it depends on the setting. We would have to look at that. But if it is a relatively limited um, role this company is going to play, um, then you just contract them below the grant contract. That is the other way. And that is also a good way to channel funds to your um, partners in the Global South. They may not be implementing partners, but they are executing partners to take the G GCF language and then they get subcontracts, but you show that very clearly in the application. Uh, Co-financing is, is not strictly required. It is being said in this way or another that uh, this is a requirement, but this is not a hard requirement. And there are many um, applications that were approved without own funding or co-funding through another third party. But definitely, if you are very big and financial capable, then there would be a higher expectation that you make a certain own contribution than in the case of a very poor organization. And an advantage it always is if you can show that you mobilize through this project substantial additional climate finance, this is always very, very well received by Iki. Okay, shall I then... Um... Thank you very much. Yeah, I think um, this is a good moment now to continue with the presentation, the second part of the presentation, so that we have enough time then to take all the questions on that second part. Okay, so go ahead. now let us talk a little bit about the ICI selection and evaluation criteria. Um, the ICI application process is um, grouped into three stages. In the first stage, you develop your project outline. You submit it to ICI. It will be examinated and a shortlisting takes place within ICI and then a number of um, good proposals uh, would be further assessed. And then um, after a couple of months, usually half a year, you will be informed if you are invited to submit a formal project proposal or not. Um, this first stage is the real hurdle. If you are invited to um, submit a formal project proposal, then it is uh, very, very, very likely that this will be approved. That is then only a formal step in which you would have to further elaborate your concept note into a fully fledged project proposal. And this uh, preparatory phase is already paid by ICI. Then after maybe another half year, this um, project proposal is going to be approved and then you start implementation. In what we are going to discuss in the next slides, we only focus on 
stage one. The pre-selection uh, process is led by uh, the ICI secretariat under this um, Mr. Behrens, and I'm only showing uh, the people just in case you are going to visit COP26 and then there will be um, a pavilion or something like that of ICI and then you have the opportunity to get into contact um, informally with ICI people and if you know the faces and if you see Philip Behrens, then I think it's a good idea if you're interested to learn a little bit or to, re to liaise with Iki, it's a good uh, chance to just make a contact so that you're known to each other. Um, so pre-selection um, takes place um, in the Iki Secretariat. For the first round of evaluation, um, the exclusion criteria of ICI are going to be used and certain quality criteria. And after that step, um, a number of proposals will be shortlisted. And these shortlisted and already with the ministry consulted um, concept notes will then be um, given to external consultants to be assessed in depth. And they will then make a ranking and uh, provide ICI with recommendations. And um, these recommendations will be discussed with ICI and the ministry. And then the ministry may or may not follow um, the ranking um, of the external consultants. Um, the final approval um, will be done by Mr. Gorison, who is the director general for that unit. And he will then formally seek the approval of um, the minister. And if the minister gives green light, then you will be informed um, you can submit a full proposal. The exclusion criteria, I'm not going to discuss in depth here because they are very obvious and you can just go through them afterwards. Um, I think this is all standard and nothing very particular. More in interesting are the formal quality criteria. And they, in fact, should be explicitly addressed in your outline and, of course, also met. So the program ICI is promoting itself as a very climate ambitious program. And thus, you should be ambitious in your application. And you should deliver measurable and ambitious results. The ICI prefers programs or concept notes that are innovative by either um, presenting a really new approach to tackle a certain problem or innovative in terms of upscaling and mainstreaming, an approach that was successfully piloted somewhere else or innovative in terms of bringing solutions that uh, prove to be good ones in other regions to new regions. So the innovative potential, what's new about your concept note, that is very much important to be highlighted. Your program or project should be um, also linked very well to the local implementation landscape. So ICI will assess of your project um, idea BS synergies with other projects, projects. They will check if it is contradicting with other um, projects in that country or region. So here you have to be coherent and you should meet uh, the needs or the trends of the local implementation landscape very, very well. <clears throat> Iki talks always about the donor landscape. They look more on what other donors are funding in this country, say Costa Rica, but they also look 
uh, on the governmental priorities, of course, of the government of Costa Rica. Programs that strengthen the resilience or uh, that strengthen altogether disadvantaged populations and that promote gender equality um, may have a higher chance than other projects to be pre-selected because this is one of the gaps of ICI that um, a focus of vul on vulnerable populations, on poor population, but also a gender focus in many of their projects is just missing or not very relevant. If you are strong here, make that very clear and that is an add-on. Then it is important that in your program or concept note, you show how the program's results, once the project has come to an end, could be sustained. That is a, another key area in the evaluation process. Is it sustainable? And then it's very much important that, he, that you clearly show that um, there is a good di division of roles and responsibilities within the implementing consortium, given that you have more than one partners. And that um, division of roles and responsibilities should also be reflected in the budget. That is very important. Then, as I said, own contribution is not necessarily a must, but it's well received. And a key criteria so far has been that um, a significant proportion of the funding is going to be allocated to national organizations, which are your partners in the countries of implementation. And usually, um, Iki says this is not a hard criteria. Um, you should show that more than 50% are being spent in the Global South. And if you show that this is being spent not only in the Global South, but through partners in the Global South, that is definitely an advantage. Um, measurable results, as I said before, are important to be shown in the concept note. And there are defined standard ind indicators how to make results measurable. So uh, for mitigation, there is an indicator you should show uh, your greenhouse gas mitigation potential or um, the increase in carbon storage in tons of um, carbon dioxide equivalents. If you can't show that in your concept note, at least you, could, you then should say, we are going to um, make an assessment of that potential during the preparatory phase, but we indicate here a range that is important. Adaptation indicator is a number of people that will be directly assisted. Um, through the program. And then you have other indicators for um, the um, enhancement of ecosystem services, for your contribution to um, make policies more um, ambitious, and so on and so forth. But these indicators are explained in the guidelines. Then there is a number of strategic considerations which you may bear in mind. Um, on the Iki website, you find a good num or you find the official criteria or the formal criteria. But then you can assume that there is also a number of informal criteria. Um, I would say there is a certain, these are tendencies, these are no strict criteria, but there is a certain tendency to prefer projects which are going to be implemented in countries which will play an important role in the political negotiations of a given year. Example, next year's COP will probably be hosted by Egypt. 
And then um, the BMU as an informal criteria may consider to uh, preferably look at at least one project being funded, which um, is going to be implemented in Egypt. Or you know that um, the ministry is closely cooperating with a number of country groupings, for example, the small island developing states and their um, associations or the Climate Vulnerable Forum. And then um, the ministry may want to also approve a project that um, is being implemented in these countries. Then the second point is that Iki, as I said, is very eager to show that this is a real innovative fund and Iki is the flagship uh, funding instrument of the, in, uh, of the ministry. So um, they like projects which are in this way or another unique, really innovative, could serve as something you can put into your window. So, that means projects that will have, for example, a very high impact or likely to have a high impact, um, or which are very transformative in their design. So if you can stress how transformative your project is and how impactful it will be, that may in how, uh, increase your chance to be um, pre-selected. And then, as I said before, and we discussed, um, Ike is very likely going to increase the share of projects with a focus on vulnerable groups and maybe especially indigenous people because of the criticism they received. And that would be a way to find a better balance in their project pipeline. And as I said, gender responsiveness also um, very important in that regard. The evaluation of those projects which um, have been pre-selected, the shortlisted ones for an in-depth evaluation is uh, going on with an evaluation matrix and that matrix is changing year by year in the details but so not so much along the general lines. And here you can see um, the weight given to the altogether 10 assessment categories, alignment with the funding priority, feasibility, transformative potential synergies, um, capacity of the donor or the, um, the consortium, the political relevance of the project idea, in how far risks are um, fairly considered and if safeguards are well in place, the sustainability and also how well aligned is the budget with the rest of uh, the application. And then you see um, the weight altogether summing up to 100%. And from here you can take that um, a key factor is how feasible is a project. And that means you have to clearly show uh, that you can achieve your goals. That means that you clearly show um, a good theory of change and work streams that are well aligned with the project objectives and so on and so forth. But then as you can see, the transformative potential and also the um, sustainability of, of the project are very important categories. This matrix has altogether 30 to 40 questions, and then there will be a scoring by the evaluators, and they score for each uh, on each of the evaluation questions. And um, well, then a number of other um, issues is going to be factored in as well as, for example, the results of the conversation the evaluators had in beforehand with the um, the ministry or the respective work unit in the ministry um, being expertise wise responsible for um, that project. 
Also important that um, a background analysis is going to take place to collect more information on the donor, sorry, on the donor landscape in the country of implementation, but also um, a background check on the consortium and its members. So um, I think that is important to know. And if you're going to apply for something where you cannot prove real expertise, then it's not likely that you will be selected. In the end, my recommendations. Um, <clears throat> say you say we are interested um, to take part in the next thematic call. Um, two to three months preparation period is not so long. Um, do that if you want to really present a good concept note in a highly competitive field, and it is really competitive, then prepare well for that. Make first an internal call for proposals that could even take place before the next ICI call is being, um, is being launched to see what are work areas where we have a unique selling point. And keep in mind the specific criteria of ICI shown in this presentation. And then you already may start to pre-select project ideas if, which may then be fit for purpose before the next call is going to be launched. For the medium grants call, the most important step is if you're interested to contribute or to apply, look for a German partner, because without a German partner, you cannot apply. And um, the small grants call, that is something that can be prepared well in beforehand. If you think one of our national partners should apply under that, also for um, gaining own experience in applying for climate finance. The calls are very similar year by year, and you can prepare very well for that by having a look at a last year's call, and then you are in a good position to apply with your partner or through your partner in the next call. As I said, the country call I would not see as, as relevant as the other three calls. It is absolutely necessary that you meet the objectives, the specific objectives of the selected funding priority. There will be probably in the next call 12 to 15 um, funding priorities falling under the four or five main categories. Really um, look at that and then design a tailor-made project. Develop a very appealing narrative and um, look for buzzwords which you place prominently to show that your project is fully aligned with the specific objectives of the call. I'm saying that before, because the first assessment round will be done within the secretariat in a relatively superficial way. They don't look into the details. They do not do any background research. And if you use the right buzzwords and if you can attract interest through an appealing narrative, then I think you have a higher chance to be pre-selected. There are some more issues which you should also look at and maybe to pick the last two uh, really try to build a strong consortium. If you have never applied to ICI, it will be more difficult. Um, so maybe you form a consortium where you work together with an organization that already successfully applied with ICI and that is known by them. That will be a trust builder. If you can, if you include local partners and if you channel a lot of money to and through them, as I said before, that will give a strong impression on your call, on your concept note. And lastly, really show very clearly how innovative and transformative your project is. In the ICI guidelines, you find their definition, what they defined as transformative and what they defined as innovative. I think these are key criteria. Um, the countries which are um, eligible, formally all ODA countries, but um, 
if you take a country from the list of Germany's 60 development partners, and this, these are much less than the ODA eligible countries, ODA eligible countries, then you might be in a better position. That is not a strict criteria, but if you want to follow that, here you have the link to find the list of Germany's development partners. And also have a look at the website of ICI showing their projects on the world map. Um, I would say feeling. I would say it's my feeling that um, many people within ICI prefer to select countries where they have a relatively strong relation and a good knowledge. And that means countries where they already had in the past ICI projects or where they have strong political interests, as I said, next COP president. So um, that doesn't mean that there is no chance to get a project approved for a country where in the past there was no ICI funded project, but at least there, there could be a certain preference for those countries where ICI is more knowledgeable about. This I skip and I say thank you and uh, looking forward to your questions now. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, this is very insightful, especially these informal um, informations um, on the call and also these tendencies uh, that we can expect uh, next year. Um, yeah, now I would like to start the discussion. Um, as uh, before, you can post your questions into the chat. If you want, you can also open your mic and um, ask your question directly. Um, maybe also at the beginning, we did the, the Menti uh, questionnaire and some have stated that they have already applied for ICI funds. So maybe it also, this would also be interesting if someone wants to share some um, yeah, experiences um, of, uh, yeah, that um, the organization has made with these past um, calls. So yeah, let's wait a bit. Um, there have already, there are already questions coming in. Um, I see one from Arabella. How relevant are favorable political relations with the country of implementation or in general, the availability of an enabling policy and economic environment in a partner country? I would say they are quite relevant. If you plan to implement a project in a failing state, I think the chance is high that this would be not considered because of the political risks. I know that there is currently a lot of discussion ongoing in the ministry and how far projects in Brazil under the current government make, make sense. On the other hand, um, if you look at the project list of ICI, you find many projects that have been or that are being implemented in countries that are difficult, that are not very climate ambitious. So I would not consider that as a too strict criteria. But if you plan to propose a project in a country which is politically instable or where you would foresee certain risks because the country is not very climate ambitious. At least you should um, make it very clear in your concept note that you are aware of these risks and how you intend to manage and keep control on these risks. And then your strategy might be convincing. Secondly, I didn't mention that before. Um, if you can add to your application, a letter of intent of a governmental authorities in the country of implementation um, saying, we are aware of that project and we are supportive to it. That is 
a good advantage. It is not a must have, but um, in the next stage where you develop the full concept, you are required to present that. And if you are able to show that in the beginning, then Icky sees, okay, these guys have thought through it, have engaged with the, the government and they are supportive. And then that is an advantage in particular in that um, category of countries. And may I add, there was another question of Amadou, we implement projects focused on reforestation. Um, mangrove in Senegal, how can we valorize reforested areas, carbon sequ sequestration? Mangrove reforestation is um, something that Iki seems to like. There is a number of these projects. And um, I mean, here you just have to calculate the carbon sequestration potential per hectare or however you want to calculate that and that is being done by ICRF or other organizations. And that um, you can show, and then I think mangrove reforestation is something Iki likes because it's biodiversity protection, it protects ecosystem services, it's a nature based solution. So you have many of these buzzwords which you can use. Back to you. Thank Maya. you for complimenting. Um, so we have. Two more questions. The one is uh, also um, yeah, asking for uh, those who have uh, responded that they have applied in the past to an ICI um, call that uh, they could share some experiences and also maybe for possible follow-up partnerships. So yeah, please jump in if someone wants to share um, his or her experiences. Um, Another question is coming from Hex Brazil. Um, the thematic call requires partnership with the government. Does it necessarily have to be with the government at the national level or can it also be developed with the governments of the states where the projects will be, be developed? Two points on that. Um, partnership is required in the way that the government should be aware of the project and support the implementation of the project. Uh, partnership is not um, a synonym for having the government on board as a formal partner. The government cannot even be a partner. Well, there's a gray zone if it is a bank, a national development bank, which you may argue is in a way part of the government or controlled or owned by the government, such a body uh, can be a partner or an implementing, executing partner. Um, but the government as such is not to be shown as an implementing um, partner, then you um, are kicked out. Now, you have to show the support and the support must not be shown by the national government. It could also be a region. It can also be a city. It all depends on your project and uh, the character of your project. And if you, for example, um, develop a project with um, climate resilience building activities in five districts of Nepal, then it's enough that the districts say, we are well informed and support that project, then it must not be the national government. Thank you very much for this answer. Um, I don't see that additional questions are coming up. Um, so I will just uh, continue with um, the closing. So um, yeah, just re with regard to the follow-up questions, there might be some questions coming up uh, afterwards when you, for example, um, read through the presentation that Thomas has prepared. Um, he has um, offered to answer 
those questions as well. So um, we can either you can either share it to Menti now, or um, also we can also uh, you can also send it to um, to me, and then I will share it um, with Thomas. Please do so until October twenty first. Um, just uh, another information on the Swiss DRR NGO platform. Um, there are also um, upcoming events. I would just like to quickly highlight the one um, in the 24th of 20, to 25th of November um, on the gender dimensions in disaster risk reduction in Bern. And you can register through the DRR NGOs platforms website. So um, yeah, we are happy to receive your questions. Um, and many thanks um, to Thomas for this very um, insightful and very hands-on practical um, presentations. It's very useful and I think we have plenty also to read. You gave us uh, quite uh, a lot of material and um, yeah, many thanks um, from on behalf of the SwissDR NGO platform. Looking forward also to um, receiving um, your answers of the follow-up questions. So thank you. Then we would close this webinar for today. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. And um, really, if you have any question, um, don't mind share it with me. And as much as I can, I will try to answer. Thank you. Great. Thank you.